Uh, good morning to everyone, uh, respected chairpersons, and my seniors as well as the colleagues. <clears throat> First of all, at the outset, I must thank the organizers to give me this opportunity to speak on this forum of Diabetes India, which is now gaining a momentum of an international recognition. So uh, the topic given to me is the musculoskeletal manifestations of diabetes. The topic has an importance because all these days, all these years, we have been focusing more on microvascular, macrovascular complications. We have been developing guidelines on treatment of diabetes with respect to micro and macrovascular complications. But what is neglected is the day-to-day -day complication that is the musculoskeletal complications. The first speaker spoke about diabetes and women. Amongst the complications that we see, the musculoskeletal complications, again, the data says that the musculoskeletal complications are also more common in the women with diabetes. And that is very important to be addressed. So to begin with, why do we need to discuss? Why are we worried? These musculoskeletal com complications increase the morbidity. They affect the day-to-day -day life. They cause pain almost every day. To a certain extent, they can cause disability. And the most important part is they remain sometimes unrecognized. They are very much overlooked in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Many of them are treatable, but we don't treat them or we just overlook them. And many of them also indicate the ongoing microvascular complications, and that is why we need to recognize them with time. So in a nutshell, if we see the musculoskeletal manifestations, <clears throat> In the upper limb, in the hands, we get a limited joint mobility. We have the trigger finger, the Dupuytren's contracture, the carpal tunnel syndrome. When it comes to shoulder, we get adhesive capsulitis, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. For the foot, we know, apart from the diabetic foot, we have the Charcot's arthropathy. At the level of muscles, diabetic amyotrophy, muscle infarction. And at the skeletal system, we have the dish and the osteoporosis. So this is just a nutshell, and I would just go one by one into all of this. But before that, we'll just have a brief discussion on the mechanism by which this is affected. So we know that there is a non-enzymatic glycation of collagen fibers due to accumulation of advanced glycation end products. There is increased collagen crosslink, which leads to fibrosis. There is increased hydration, which is again mediated by the aldol reductase pathway. There is increased accumulation of Abnormal collagen due to advanced glycation end products, which is re resistant to enzymatic digestion. There is associated neuropathy, and there are multiple cytokines because diabetes, we know, is a chronic systemic inflammation. So there are some cytokines which also play some role in the background to cause these neuromuscular manifestations. Now coming to the most common that we see in our day-to-day -day life is the adhesive capsulitis of the shoulder, or we call it as a frozen shoulder. So it's a progressive painful restriction of the shoulder movements. Both active and passive movements are involved, especially the external rotation and the abduction. And just imagine if a person cannot abduct his shoulder, to what extent the problem can be. We see women coming to us who are unable to unbutton their blouses or unable to wear their uh, inner wares. So this is the extent of the problem that we have to address. The prevalence can be as high as 30% in diabetes patients as compared to 2 to 10% in non-diabetic patients. And again, the pathology is the thickening of the capsule resulting in the reduced volume of the glenohumeral joint. Again, treatment is simple. You need to identify it. You must go for graded physiotherapy. Some patients might require intraarticular injections of steroids. Sometimes people have used intraarticular distilled water just to increase the volume of the joint. And in severe cases, one has to go for manipulation under general anesthesia. But what is important is patient education because most of the patients, they don't self-report about shoulder pain. They just assume that it is a sort of a simple thing and they keep on, um, uh, you know, just uh, <clears throat> they keep on lingering with that shoulder pain without reporting to the doctor. And when they come to our clinic, even we don't, report, we don't uh, pay attention to the shoulder pain. The next is the limited joint mobility of the hands which is also called as a diabetic keroarthropathy. And it is, a, again, a painless condition, which is characterized by thick, rigid, tight, waxy skin of the dorsum of the hands. And there is painless flexion deformity of the uh, fingers. So it's mostly seen in type 1 diabetes patients associated with long duration, poor metabolic control. There is 
uh, ongoing uh, microvascular complications, especially neuropathy, and the prevalence in type 1 diabetes patients can be as high from 8 to 30 percent. And how it is recognized is basically by the prayer sign and the tabletop sign. So the patients are unable to approximate their hands when asked to do a prayer pose, or they may not be able to place their hands uh, flat on a table. So early, again, early recognition is important to, in order to pro, uh, prevent the contractures because once they develop contracture, it is going to be a fixed deformity. And what we need to do is again, optimal glycemic control, cessation of smoking, physiotherapy and occupational therapy in all these patients. So this is what is a typical prayer hand. The next is a Dupuytren's contracture, which is again prevalent in diabetes patients to the tune of 20 to 63%, characterized by thickening, shortening and fibrosis of the palma fascia. And the prevalence increases with age and duration of diabetes. Most common finger involved is the middle or the ring finger. It may be bilateral in some patients. It is generally milder in diabetic patients, but the only way to help is physiotherapy or sometimes in patients, you can use local steroid. So this is what is the classical presentation of patients who come with Dupuytren's contracture. Then come another problem that is the trigger finger or what is called as the flexor stenosing sinovitis. Prevalence again, 11 to 20 percent, associated with long duration of diabetes. The patient typically has a catching sensation or a locking phenomena associated with the flexion of the finger and unable to extend the finger without a support. Clinically, what you can see is a palpable nodule over the metacarpophalangeal joint and there is thickening along the flexor tendon. Multiple fingers can be involved or you can have a single finger involved. Again, if you identify it earlier, most of the patients can be cured with just physiotherapy or intraarticular steroids, and sometimes patient might have to go for uh, reconstructive or plastic surgery. So this is a typical trigger finger. Then comes the carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a sort of entrapment neuropathy. Prevalence again, 11 to 20 percent, up to 30 percent in patients with polyneuropathies. More common in women, again associated with the advanced age and duration of disease. Typically, patients will have symptoms over the median nerve involvement. Both sensory and motor symptoms can arise. And most of the time, in advanced case, patients will present with thinner muscle atrophy, or they may have deformities of the uh, thumb, or they may not be able to function the thumb in terms of opposition as well as abduction. We identified with the clinical signs the tinnel sign or the Fallon sign. So this is the classical distribution of the median nerve of the hand. So you can see that the sensation is at the lateral, uh, the radial uh, three and a half fingers. And what you see in the phalanx test is basically you dorsiflex or plantarflex the uh, 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 wrist and there is compression of the median nerve and the patient's symptoms get aggravated. Similarly, in tinnel sign, if you tap over the median nerve, the patient will have paresthesia or a current-like sensation in the distribution of the nerve. So easy to identify. So moving on to now the skeletal system involvement. We have diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. The problem here is that it can mimic ankylosing spondylitis. Patients may present with some sort of back aches. And many a times, you know, even in the normal population, HLA-B27 turns out to be positive. So almost 4% of normal uh, adult population can have HLA-B27 positivity. And when these patients present with uh, an X-ray suggestive of DISH, many of time they will be mislabeled as ankylosing spondylitis. So we need to differentiate between the X-ray findings of ankylosing spondylitis as well as DISH. So DISH is again seen in type 2 diabetes patients, especially the obese ones. Now that uh, condition is characterized by new bone formation in the thoracolumbar spine. So there is basically metaplastic ossification of the anterior longitudinal ligament of the spine. And this closely mimics ankylosing spondylitis. The treatment, however, is uh, mostly uh, symptomatic treatment. You have to just give painkillers. But the diagnosis has to be made and differentiated between ankylosing spondylitis. So what we see here is uh, to diagnose a dish, you need to have four contiguous vertebra, which are joined to ossification of the anterior longitudinal ligament. At the same time, you can see that this space is preserved. So the height of the patient is not compromised. And that is what is the major differentiating feature between DISH and ankylosing spondylitis radiological findings. Now the most important, the charcoat arthropathy. In diabetic foot, we keep on discussing this. So I would not go into the details of uh, charcoat arthropathy. But what is 
uh, charcoal arthropathy is basically a consequence of peripheral neuropathy characterized by progressive painless degenerative destructive arthropathy of the foot. So the order of involvement is the ankle joint followed by metatarsophalangeal joint and then the tar tarsometatarsal joints. The prevalence can be up to 13% in patients of diabetes and diagnosis based on clinical features as well as radiology. The treatment initially can be conservative, but later on it has to be surgical if the patient has developed complications. So if you see the pathogenesis of uh, uh, charcot arthropathy, there is neuropathy. And on the background of neuropathy, if there is repeated trauma, then these patients develop uh, loss of proprioception followed by all trauma leading to joint loss. There is uh, joint uh, uh, there is subluxation of the joints followed by destruction of the bone and ultimately the patient develops deformity. There is loss of the plantar arch of the foot and ultimately the patient develops rocker bottom foot. So this is the classical x-ray in the advanced stage where you have destruction of all the joints of the foot and ultimately the patient develops deformity and many a times these patients have to undergo amputation once they develop osteomyelitis secondary to infections. Coming to diabetic amyotrophy, which is again a very important uh, observation in uh, patients of diabetes. It is characterized by diffuse proximal lower limb weakness. There's advanced muscle wasting, diffuse pain, asymmetrical loss of tendon jerks, associated with significant weight loss, usually elderly type 2 diabetes patients, uncontrolled type 1 diabetes patients, Again, it is an inflammatory immune-mediated vascular radiculoplexopathy or something microvasculitis leading to neuronal injuries. Diagnosis is by diagnosis of exclusion with the help of electrodiagnostic tests. You can support your diagnosis. The course of this disease is usually self-limiting. Most of the time, patients do not respond to most of the therapy. There are trials where patients have been uh, treated with steroids or immunosuppressants, but in vain. So as of now, the treatment would be more of preventive, trying to do good glycemic control and trying to go for more resistance exercises in order to prevent sarcopenia. Muscle infarction, very rare, but unique to diabetes. Two years mortality, around 10%, usually seen in long-standing type 1 diabetes patients. Acute onset muscle pain and swelling usually of the thigh muscles or sometimes even in the calf. There may be differential diagnosis of acute myositis. One can also think of ruptured abscess, myotrophy, sometimes uh, warm infestations of the muscles. But the MRI would be diagnostic. There would be hyperintense echo muscles on the T2-weighted imaging. And the treatment is usually symptomatic with the help of vasodilators, antiplatelets, NSAIDs, and immobilization of the limb. But it is a very, very devastating uh, condition of the patients. Most important, osteoporosis, which is again less defined by the clinicians. Type 1 patients, the relative risk for hip fracture in female is 6.9. With duration more than 5 years, the relative risk increases to 12.25. In type 2, even with a normal BMD on DEXA machine, you can still have osteoporosis because diabetes leads to altered micro texture of the bone, even though the bone mineral con uh, content is not reduced. Then we have drugs like pioglitazone, which can increase the risk of osteoporosis. But what is important as clinicians and diabetologists is we need to identify the risk factors for the fractures as well as the falls in the elderly population. We need to prevent hypoglycemia. We need to check for neuropathy. We also need to check for associated disease, which can cause malabsorption like celiac disease, hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism. And then we can also look for risk factors in diabetes patients in terms of which can cause increased falls in terms of retinopathy leading to blindness, neuropathy leading to falls, and then associated uh, autonomic neuropathy which can lead to hypotension and falls and arthropathy. At the same time, we must rule out vitamin D deficiency in all these patients. So to summarize, uh, all the musculoskeletal manifestations, there are conditions which are limited only to diabetes, and the unique one is the muscle infarction. Then there are conditions which are more frequent in diabetes, like the limited joint mobility, trigger finger, carpal tunnel syndrome, dupitans contracture, frozen shoulder, charcot arthropathy. And then there are conditions which share the risk factors at diabetes and which can coexist with diabetes. They are in the form of DISH, gout, pseudogout, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis. And we need to keep all of these in our mind whenever we see the patients with musculoskeletal complaints in our diabetes clinic.
So the way to move forward is, on one hand, we have to reduce the morbidity, pain, and disability in our patients. We have to recognize we may not overlook them, and we must identify that they, most of them are treatable, and they indicate microvascular complications. But what we need to have as it as a multidisciplinary approach, we need to have an alliance with physiotherapists, orthopedicians, to identify these problems whenever we are unable to tackle these problems. So with that, I thank you all, and I hope to uh, uh, justify the topic.